Hello and welcome to Food Tank's webinar series. This is Sarah Small and I'm Food Tank's Global Events Director. I'm really excited about today's webinar with Anna LaPay. She's an author, educator, activist, project director of Food Mythbusters and Real Food Media Project, and co-founder of Small Planet Institute and the Small Planet Fund. Today her presentation will cover the GMO debate. This webinar will be recorded and posted on foodtank.com afterwards. You can also follow along and participate on Twitter using hashtag foodtank. Also, please submit your questions using the chat box in your control panel or email them to me at sarah at foodtank.com. That's S-A-R-A-H at foodtank.com or via Twitter is great as well. So without further ado, Anna, it's wonderful to have you here today and I'm excited to hear your presentation. I'll give you the floor now. Thank you, Sarah, and hello, everyone. It is a pleasure to be with all of you. And uh, I will be speaking for about a half an hour, and then we'll be having time for questions. So be thinking about questions as you're listening. And of course, in this short amount of time, I am not going to uh, be able to get into all of the complexity of this issue. But what I'm hoping to achieve in this webinar is to give you a sense of um, sort of some of the big debates about GMOs, some of the sense of what are the uh, what are the claims that we're hearing about GMOs and how to respond to them. So to, to begin though, I really just want to begin with the definition. What are we talking about here? Uh, and I like to use the World Health Organization definition, which uh, says that GMOs or genetically modified organisms can be defined as organisms and they can be plants, animals, or microorganisms in which the genetic material DNA has been altered in a way that does not occur naturally by mating and or natural recombination. And so for our conversation today, we're really talking about agricultural genetic engineering or biotech crops, uh, also known as GMOs. So that's what we're talking about today. And my understanding about GMOs has really been informed by about a dozen years of research on the ground, talking with farmers here in the US and around the world, about 20 different countries, uh, and also uh, really mining the literature on uh, the science of GMOs and, and the GMO debate. And, and, and then I've been doing work also through organizations, Real Food Media and Food Myths. And so what I want to talk about today are what are six of the big messages that we hear from the biotech industry about their products? What are those messages that we're hearing? And, and how do we tease them apart? How do we make sense of whether these are uh, just propaganda and marketing from an industry or whether there's some real veracity to these claims? And so you'll see here, these are the six big messages that I feel like we hear a lot of. And I'll go through over the next uh, few minutes, I'll go through each of these six claims. And so the first, and I think one of the ones I hear so much is that we need GMOs to feed the world. The second is that this technology is a way to really increase yields. It kind of goes hand in hand with that first claim. The third claim is that GMOs are really helpful to farmers. And if we care about farmers, which I think all of us do, they are the people who are feeding us, uh, then we, you know, then of course we should be pro-GMO. The fourth claim is that uh, GMOs are helpful for the environment. They do things like uh, reduce the amount of water we need to use on agricultural land or reduce erosion. The fifth claim is this claim that they also have this benefit of reducing chemical use. And then the sixth claim is kind of like, well, you know, even if you're not buying in all those other claims, there really is no other alternative. There's really no other way to grow enough food to, um, to have enough for all of us. And there's really no other model out there. And so what I want to do is go through each of these six claims and, and share with you some of my thinking about how do, we, um, how do we make sense of it. Because I think what we can see when we ask, what is the real story? What do we see on the ground is that uh, we have more than almost two decades worth of evidence from planting commercialized GMOs. So we have a pretty good um, body of evidence to be able to look at these claims and see whether they stand up to the test of scrutiny. And uh, just a little bit of history, the first GMO food product in the US was introduced in 1994. It was something called the Flavor Saver Tomato. It didn't really last in the market too long. Um, and shortly after that, uh, introduction of that tomato, the industry really focused on uh, commodity crops like corn and soy. By 1999, GMO crops were planted on more than 100 million acres in the U.S. And today, most of a, a huge vast majority of our corn and cotton, canola, soy are GMO. 
The biggest company in the market is Monsanto. In 2013, it brought in about $15 billion in sales from its two main divisions, which are its biotech seeds and agricultural chemical products. Um, so, so looking at you know the growth of this industry and how much uh, um, revenue is coming into these companies uh, and looking at how much land is being planted in these crops, we can really ask, okay, are they delivering on these promises? How do what's happening on the ground match up with those six claims that we're hearing? So get, to get into the first one, this claim that we need them to feed the world, well, we can really see that uh, actually we don't need GMOs to feed the world. We have known for decades, it's still true today, that there is more than enough calories being produced on the planet today to actually make all of us chubby. Um, the problem is not a scarcity of food, it's uh, a scarcity of power, it's poor people not being able to access that food, it's choices about what's being grown, so not healthy food that's really nourishing, but uh, commodity crops that go to feed livestock. And then it's things like you see in this slide, the fact that just looking at food waste alone, which I know has been a huge issue Food Tank and its members have been concerned about, just looking at food waste alone. We waste enough food that if we just ended food waste, we would be able to, to feed all of the almost 900 million people hungry in the world today. So I really think that at the outset, we really need to disabuse ourselves of this notion that we somehow need a certain technology and GMO specifically to feed the world, that, that hunger is complex, it's about politics, it's about access and power, it's not just about you know, how much of a certain crop we're growing on an acre of farmland. Um, the other thing that the sort of second point on this is to look at, well, you know, if GMOs are supposed to be feeding us, well, what actually are GMOs that are being planted today? And when you look at, and this is a slide, this is a little bit, these numbers are um, uh, the most recent data we had available. And if you look at this data from the USDA, you can see that what is really being planted in the US that's genetically modified crops are, as I mentioned before, soy, cotton, corn, uh, and some canola. And those products aren't what we necessarily eat directly. A lot of that GMO commodities that are being grown are going to feed livestock. Um, Monsanto specifically in 2013, if you look at where its sales came from, only 13% of its sales in that year came from food we eat directly, from vegetables or selling seeds of actual food. Uh, the rest of its sales came from growing GMO corn, soy, cotton. Again, not that we are eating directly. In the case of corn and soy, a lot of that going into the livestock industry um, or into biofuels. You can also look, oh, sorry, just to stick on the slide for a second, you can look at what are the traits that are being commercialized. Are we seeing commercialized traits for the kinds of things that might actually help address hunger? Uh, and what we're seeing is that seeds really, today, GMO seeds, have been modified really to just do uh, a handful of things, either be herbicide resistant, or express an insecticide, or in some cases, they have multiple traits, multiple of those traits. Some are also engineered with a gene from a soil bacterium known as Bt, you might have heard, causing the seeds to produce a protein toxic to certain insects. And um, so really, I just wanna drive on this point that nearly all GMOs, virtually 100% of the commercialized GMOs today, are either replicating or resisting a pesticide. There are not currently any plants engineered in a widespread way that are creating better nutrition or increasing yields or have any of the other benefits we often hear associated with GMOs. Um, these kinds of traits, things like better nutrition or flood resistance or drought resilience, all of these are really complex traits that are not replicable in a lab. Uh, that this isn't about being able to, to tweak one gene or tweak, uh, tweak uh, uh, the DNA to be able to produce that quality in a crop. So the other kind of point to this conversation about, you know, are GMOs feeding the world is to look at, well, where are GMOs being planted and to whom are they serving? And you'll see in this slide, this is a breakdown from 2014 of where uh, this is by uh, acreage of cropland devoted to GMOs. So you can see that uh, uh, most of these products are being grown in just a handful of countries. You can see three countries control the lion's share of commercialized land for GMOs. So again, this isn't something, this isn't a technology that's being used uh, widely around the world. It's concentrated in a handful of countries. And those handful, the US, Brazil, and Argentina, it's concentrated where these three countries are growing a lot of commodity crops like corn and soy. Again, not to feed people directly. 
So let's jump into the second claim. This claim that you know GMOs are super productive, and that's why they're going to be better for the planet and better for better for feeding the world. And what we know is that even just looking at the narrowest definition of productivity, kind of yield per acre, that the record around GMOs is, is pretty underwhelming. Um, what you hear a lot is a company like Monsanto, I've, I've heard, likes to point out that yields for corn in the US from 96 to 2008 uh, rose by 28%, which on the surface sounds maybe really, really promising. But this confuses correlation with causation. And what I mean by that is that, yes, overall, corn yields did shoot up during those years. But when researchers looked at to what extent we can credit genetic engineering, what they found is that actually most of that yield increase, so again, 28% yield jump from 96 to 2008, most of that actually should be credited to conventional breeding and other improvements in farm methods. It wasn't because genetic engineering proved to increase yields. The other thing that we can see is we've got, and I'll show you in this slide and the next slide, just a couple examples. But there are so many studies that are showing that actually there's a huge yield advantage to non-GMO soy, non-GMO corn. Uh, there was a study from the Rodale Institute, for instance, that looked at organic corn and found that the organic corn did so much better during drought years. There's a sense that, uh, and this slide talks about the yield advantage for non-GMO soybeans. This is a study that looked at um, corn varieties, non-GMO corn varieties, that found that uh, diverse varieties of corn had a huge increase uh, and um, huge uh, greater benefit during drought than uh, both um, conventional as well as GMO varieties. So to jump to this third point, and I, I think all of these claims, it's really important to understand them because on the surface they can be so convincing. So this is this third point that I, you know, that I hear that uh, uh, from the industry that GMOs are really great for farmers, that they benefit farmers, they reduce farmers' risks, they are um, creating profit for farmers. But what we are seeing is that GMOs have proven to be a real trap for farmers. Uh, and what I mean by that is we're seeing that as farmers move toward the GMO model, that uh, they're seeing escalating technology fee costs for those seeds. They're also seeing a whole host of problems that have always existed on, on, in agriculture but have worsened because of GMOs. And these are problems like herbicide-resistant weeds and insecticide-resistant pests. So you might have heard people talk about super weeds as a, as a um, consequence of GMOs, and, and that's what I'm talking about here. So um, just to give you one example, uh, as a, a result of the widespread use of glyphosate-based herbicides, these are herbicides that uh, Monsanto products are resistant to, uh, that as Monsanto has released these GMO products on the marketplace that are resistant to glyphosate herbicides, the farmers have increasingly used glyphosate. And what we're seeing is that, and the slide shows this one Iowa State University study that found that there's an incredible increase in the amount of weeds that are actually resistant now to, to glyphosate. And it's, it's a huge problem for farmers. Here you can see on this slide, we're looking at uh, this is data from the USDA and superweed data compiled by Dr. Charles Benbrook that you can see over this time period uh, from the early 90s to about 2010, you can see this huge increase in glyphosate applied. This is in the United States on corn, soy, and cotton. And you can see a, a similar arc in terms of the increase in herbicide-resistant crops. Um, the... Um, I'm going to just stick with this slide for a second. So I'm going to jump to the, the, the second concern that farmers are seeing, but just to stay with this slide for a second, I just want to stress, uh, for those of you who may not be farmers, uh, but who may not really realize the gravity of this, I mean, this is a super serious issue, and this is something that is really uh, now plaguing farmers uh, in this country, and it's a direct result of the increase in herbicide use tied to GMOs. Um, so uh, the, um, the second uh, uh, point that I wanted to make, kind of this other consequence, is, uh, and I mentioned the kind of the second thing we're seeing is insect, uh, 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 so is um, insects that are becoming pest resistant, uh, that are becoming, uh, I mean, that are becoming resistant to the insecticides. So um, in this Wall Street Journal article, we're seeing that uh, this journalist reported uh, that Midwestern, far Midwestern farmers who had taken on and started growing this pest-resistant corn. 
since early, uh, kind of the mid-1990s, are starting to see that it actually has diminishing power over some of the bugs that they're most worried about, like corn rootworm, which is a serious concern for U.S. farmers. What they're seeing is that, uh, and if you sort of explain how this resistance works, is that uh, what happens is that over time, this sort of repeated exposure to the GMO corn's kind of bug-killing proteins means that um, over time, there are a small number of these rootworms, this uh, serious pest to corn crops. Uh, over time, a small number of these um, of the rootworm are able to consume that toxin in the plant and actually survive it. And then they are reproducing by the thousands and spreading across fields uh, that are being used to grow corn every year. So these are the sort of the spread of this pest that actually is not bothered by this uh, corn that's ex expressing this insecticide. And um, since Wall Street Journal article covered this concern in March 2015, um, what we're seeing is farmers then turning to older and more toxic pesticides as they're finding that these uh, uh, pesticides are not working as effectively. So what we're hearing is that these products aren't necessarily better for farmers. And, and certainly as these concerns around uh, uh, super weeds, for instance, and uh, the corn rootworm taking hold, uh, you know, this will be only become more of a concern for farmers. We also hear in the industry I've seen claim that GMO seeds are really effective for reducing soil erosion or reducing water and chemical use. And uh, what we're finding is that actually uh, that that's just not been the case. Um, and I want to talk first about what we're seeing in terms of the increase in chemical use and then secondly about some of the evidence around affecting uh, uh, soil in particular. Um, so. There was a New York Times article in April 2013 that uh, started, that, that documented something that, that researchers had started seeing, which is that in this um, increasing use of glyphosate, that's that herbicide that I mentioned earlier, that you're starting to see a huge impact on soils on the land. So this is an Iowa farmer talking about you know, his experience on his own farm of what happened to his soil and the properties of his soil with the application of glyphosate on the land. And um, what we're seeing is that, uh, uh, so there's that concern for soil, the soil quality as glyphosate kills the microorganisms in the soil. What we're also seeing is, and there's a study from the Union of Concerned Scientists called High and Dry from May 2012, if any of you wanna dig more into this, um, we're seeing a real uh, concern about how as it relates to the impact on soils, how GMOs are actually not protecting our soils and leading to an increase in soil erosion. Uh, one of the things that um, I know I had heard a lot is that um, the industry claiming that, well, you know, if you look at uh, soil erosion in the U.S., they would say, well, look, there's been a decline in soil erosion on, cra on cropland in the U.S. since the introduction of genetically engineered seeds, and therefore it must be that genetically engineered seeds are, are um, to thank for that. But, but once again, this is kind of confusing cause and correlation, um, that it's not because these crops were introduced that we see this reduction in soil erosion, that it, it's actually that the introduction of engineered seeds in the mid-1990s just happened to coincide with the introduction of federal policies that encouraged better conservation practices on farmland and that was um, uh, uh, that created better practices across all farmland. So farmers were uh, uh, encouraged to protect their soils better and there was an increase in uh, um, uh, uh, those practices that led to a decrease in soil erosion. Again, not because of GMOs, but because of farmer practices that happened at time with the introduction of GMOs. And what we're seeing is that, uh, in contrast, there's really good evidence coming out of organic agricultural research that's showing that agricultural techniques actually can really improve soil quality, can reduce erosion, improve water efficiency, uh, and um, uh, and we're seeing just higher amounts of uh, soil carbon content in organic farms. All of that is coming out of the research around organic agriculture. So I want to jump in the last few minutes to our fifth and sixth claims. So the fifth is this claim that, um, you know, this claim that, yes, GMOs reduce the amount of chemicals we're using. And, of course, we don't want to be using rampant amount of chemicals on farmland. But actually what we're seeing is that GMOs have led to more chemicals, not less. 
Um, I also think it's really ironic that you have a company like Monsanto uh, making this claim. So I was just listening to a recent debate with the Monsanto executive who was saying that their products are reducing pesticide use when the company itself is a pesticide manufacturer. Uh, in 2013, it brought in $4 billion in sales from its herbicide, including an herbicide called Harness, whose active ingredient uh, the EPA has classified as a possible carcinogen. And of course, historically, the company was a leading producer of some of the nation's most toxic pesticides, including uh, uh, the ingredients uh, for the defoliant agent orange that was used in the Vietnam War. Um, but those facts aside, what we're seeing is that the evidence from what from these years of commercialized GMOs is showing that actually there's been an overall increase in agricultural chemical use since the introduction of GMOs, not a decrease. Uh, in one peer-reviewed study uh, published in Environmental Sciences Europe, uh, they found that actually overall there is an overall 404 million pound increase in pesticide use from 1996 to 2011 because of the introduction of GMOs. And so yes, there, the industry points to for, that there was this initial drop in uh, some chemical use, chemical use around uh, for corn and cotton with the introduction of BT corn and BT cotton, but overall the data is really clear that there was this overall, overall large increase in chemicals, especially glyphosate. What we're also seeing is that as we're seeing some of that pest resistance and weed resistance I mentioned earlier, these same companies are actually pushing for new types of GMOs that are uh, resistant to things like 2,4-D, these toxic pesticides that we definitely don't want to be using in uh, on, on farmland today. Um, the other thing that we should all be very concerned about, and I've mentioned glyphosate a few times, is this growing agricultural use of glyphosate, which is this herbicide that so probably many of you on the line and probably saw in the food tanks coverage of this, uh, the World Health Organization just declared in new research uh, as a probable carcinogen. So there's this growing use of glyphosate that directly relates to uh, GMOs because one of the, Monsanto's biggest products, one of the biggest products out there is a GMO that's resistant to glyphosate. And the Center for Food Safety put together this slide that I think really clearly shows this um, uh, uh, increase in glyphosate usage. Uh, and when Roundup Ready, that's, that's a GMO product that's resistant to glyphosate, Roundup Ready corn and Roundup Ready soybeans were introduced. And then I think what is really powerful is to look at this slide. So this is taking data from 1992 to 2011. And each click of my button will take you forward a year until we get to 2011. And what you'll see is the estimated use of glyphosate on agricultural land in pounds per square mile. This is from the US Geological Survey. And this just really illustrates where and how much more glyphosate is being used from 92 to 2011, again, directly tied to this glyphosate resistant GMO products. Um, so you can see it growing, and you can see it's growing in the places you would imagine, in the Midwest, um, but it's really uh, quite widespread and quite striking how much it grows over the years. And uh, uh, until we get to 2011, you can see just how much glyphosate is spread uh, around the country. So the sixth and last claim is that, you know, the sort of there is no alternative claim. In other words, you know, all, everything I said, you know, you may be nodding your head as you're hearing me talk, but what are we going to do otherwise? We do need to be producing food in some fashion. We do need to be producing food at some level of yield. And uh, is there truly an alternative to this GMO technology? And for me in this work, I think one of the most encouraging things over the past 12 years is to see despite the tiny, tiny, tiny share of funding going toward organic agriculture or what's also called agroecology, we are seeing this just incredible amounts of, of benefits from agroecology and organic agriculture. We're seeing an uptake in practices on the farm that don't use uh, toxic pesticides, that don't use synthetic fertilizer, really spreading globally. Uh, last year, I was at the summit of the International Federation of Organic Agricultural Movements in Istanbul, Italy, uh, Turkey, and met uh, thousands of people, farmers and agricultural specialists and researchers from all around the world that represent this global movement that we don't hear so much about in the United States, but that is happening here and it's also happening around the world. Uh, we certainly, I feel like Food Tank has done a really good job of covering a lot of these solution stories. And what we're hearing is that 
uh, agroecology, as I mentioned, it's sort of another term for this way of farming, is a really powerful tool to benefit uh, farmers around the world. And one of the reasons why it's such a powerful tool is that unlike the GMO technology, agroecological practices on the farm do not require farmers have to buy anything. This isn't about buying a seed from a multinational corporation headquartered half a world away. It's not about having to buy synthetic fertilizer from a similar corporation half a world away or about having to buy chemicals. It's about really working with your own land and with your own farm as much as possible to generate soil fertility from growing uh, 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 legumes, for instance, that fix nitrogen in the soil, uh, through integrating livestock on your farm. It's about saving seeds and sharing seeds. It's about developing all kinds of ecological techniques that result in really powerful, powerful yields and powerful productivity. And uh, we are, again, we're seeing this around the world. Uh, and again, Food Tank, I think, has really documented a lot of this. Uh, I was just reading recently about the state of Andhra Pradesh in uh, India, where um, the communities across that state had witnessed a huge toll uh, on their land of toxic pesticide use and synthetic fertilizer, including acute poisonings. And uh, the state decided to put a lot of funding toward agroecology agro as a solution. In 2004, Andhra Pradesh community groups started a pilot study teaching 300,000 farmers what they called non-pesticide management for their farms. They were taught alternatives to toxic pesticides to deal with their worst pest problems, uh, things that did not create those super pests or super weeds. And uh, they developed these alternatives that allowed them to no longer have to use these pesticides that were not good for their land, but especially not good for them. It, they were you know, causing health problems for farmers themselves. Under the new program, farmers learned how to use these natural controls. And um, the result is that uh, they saw a huge decrease in the amount of crops lost to pests, that their yield stayed steady or even increased, and that farmers who had previously had to pay high amounts for chemicals were paying much less and earning higher incomes. Today, that program has expanded to an estimated 1 million farmers across 1 million hectares in the state of Andhra Pradesh. And I, I go into detail with that story because it's just one example of the kinds of solutions we're hearing around the world that really flies in the face of this notion that there is no alternative. In fact, the alternative is um, really thriving and really showing how important it is to be training farmers in this way, a farming that doesn't make them dependent on bought inputs like chemicals and GMOs. Uh, I'm, um, this slide from the FAO Director General, I think really expresses the sense of this movement that's happening around the world, the need to move away from, uh, from a kind of agricultural production that's so reliant on chemicals. Um, I think it's important to also remember why aren't we hearing these solution stories as much as we should, despite, you know, despite the fabulous efforts of groups like Food Tank. And part of it is that we just are under-resourced on this side. I mentioned that international farming organization whose summit I went to in Istanbul last year, just consider that that organization alone has just a tiny sliver of the resources of a company like Monsanto. That agricultural, uh, uh, organic agricultural movement organization's annual budget in 2013 was just 0.01% of all of Monsanto's sales globally. Uh, or that uh, research has shown that just 1% of all the dollars for agricultural research, both public and private worldwide, goes into developing and improving and uh, uh, spreading organic agricultural methods. So uh, I want to close with this, what I hope is this very upbeat message that uh, you know, we often hear that we can't feed the world with organic farming because it's simply too hard to bring it to scale. Uh, but what I would argue is that we've actually just never invested, not even come close to investing in the kind of resources that would be necessary to develop the training and the practices and the innovations to really, to really move organic farming to scale. The problem isn't with organic farming itself, it's with, it, with, it's with our lack of investment in organic farming. And um, so I just really think that we, if we want to debate this question about how we feed the future, it's really key that we continue to draw on the evidence 
which I hope I've shared some today that's helped clarify some of that, and that we call upon our public institutions that we are supporting with our tax dollars to in invest in organic farming and research. Um, so thank you for your time. I look forward to hearing your questions, and I just want to thank Food Tank for all of its uh, really valuable work in helping educate people about all of these critical issues. Thank you. Anna, the presentation and really covered a lot of the myths around GMOs. So uh, we do have about 10, 15 minutes for our Q&A session. Uh, just a reminder to our listeners that they continue to can continue to send in their questions using the chat box on Twitter with hashtag food tank or email me Sarah at foodtank.com. So the first question, uh, Anna, comes from Monica. She asks, how does recent the recent push for labeling laws play into this debate? Do you think consumption of GMOs would decrease if a labeling law was passed? Yeah, that's a great question. And you know, I think what's been so wonderful about the labeling debate is that it's increased public awareness that these products even exist and has gotten people asking questions. And I think it's really helped people ask this question of you know, why is there so much resistance to allowing the public to know what's in their food? If you look at how much money uh, the industry has poured into these labeling fights. It's tens of millions of dollars. I think by last count it was something like 100 million dollars was spent by the industry, including companies uh, that we don't always associate with GMOs, but companies that are using GMO products in their uh, GMO ingredients in their products, but spent about a hundred million dollars to fight these against these labeling initiatives. Um, do I think people would consume less of those products if they were labeled? Uh, you know, I, I um, definitely don't have a crystal ball, but I think that we all should be given the right to know what's in our food. We shouldn't have to be detectives and sleuths and experts to know. Um, you know, I remember having this moment myself being, I thought, very educated on these issues and um, pulling out my box of Kashi cereal to feed my three-year-old daughter at the time and it dawning on me that nowhere on the label did I know whether the corn and soy used in that product was GMO or not GMO and I had just been assuming because of its beautiful packaging, that it was all natural. And I remember calling the company and they basically said, you know, yeah, we cannot guarantee that this is GMO free. So, um, but that took, you know, my, I, I, it took this kind of level of, of sophistication and asking questions that I think most consumers should just be able to find it on their label. And I think if, if, if it were labeled here as it is in dozens of countries overseas, you know, we would, we would, I think, also be having a much more public conversation about do we need this technology to who, you know, who benefits from it and, uh, um, you know, should we be rethinking how much of our farmland is devoted to it? Great. Thank you, Anna. Uh, the next question comes from Arcadia. She asks, what reasons specifically do you have, uh, do you feel have convinced other countries to ban GMOs and why haven't they worked here in the United States? Hmm. That's a great question. So, you know, uh, from my understanding of um, some of the debates in other countries, you know, you're, they're kind of as varied as, as you would imagine. Um, and I don't want to paint with a broad brushstroke those concerns. But, but I think a lot of the concerns um, that I'm aware of from other countries are the kinds of concerns that I, I mentioned in, in my presentation. So concerns about these environmental impacts that I mentioned are weigh heavily in some of the public debates I've heard about putting either a moratorium or a ban on GMOs. Um, the second thing that I've heard and I didn't talk about so much, it wasn't a focus in my presentation, is this concern about potential health consequences of consuming GMOs. So um, a lot of uh, other countries have a different uh, policy making approach around potential negative consequences of, uh, of products that's called a precautionary principle. So it's this principle of kind of taking a, uh, uh, an approach of, of not, um, uh, you know, not making a policy uh, and allowing something into the marketplace unless it's proven to be safe. Whereas in our policy making, we tend to take a more risk analysis approach, kind of cost benefit analysis approach, uh, so that we have said kind of the, the burden is on um, those to try to prove that it causes harm versus uh, those to say that it has, has no potential to cause harm. And I think that, um, I think that the reason why it's been so hard to, have that conversation here, frankly, is just how much more influence 
corporations have on policymaking in this country than in a lot of other countries. When you look at uh, how many lobbyists are on Capitol Hill, um, how much corporate contributions influence federal policy, um, it's, you know, I think it's, it's, a, it's important to remember that um, that's a huge influence on policymaking here. I was just looking recently at, um, uh, I'm not going to remember the figure off the top of my head, but it was some striking number that there are more lobbyists on Capitol Hill by quite a, a large number than there are policymakers who we elected to represent us. And that now there are, um, you know, that, that really shapes the kinds of policies we're seeing and how much influence these corporations can have on regulation. Thank you, Anna. Uh, the next question comes from Alex, and, and he or she asks, what do you feel is the role of small farmers and techniques like direct market selling to help reduce the growing GMO industry? And I might even add to that to protect the land and environment as well. Yeah. So, uh, you know, I think small farmers are, are vital uh, to, uh, to a strong food system. I mean, we, we know that when you talk about kind of what a healthy ecosystem looks like, a key word is biodiversity. It's diversity. It's having lots of different, um, you know, having that difference and having that thriving difference. And I think that small farmers represent the diversity of a food system. Uh, you know, I mentioned at the end of my remarks this concern that people have that, quote unquote, we can't take organic to scale. And uh, uh, I would argue that actually one of the ways to kind of rethink what we mean by scale is, is to look at, you know, how do we create infrastructure that allows us to scale up the impact of many small farmers. And let me give you a concrete example of that. Uh, one of the most impressive farms I've ever been to is a farm called New Forest Farms in Wisconsin. And it's run by this amazing farmer who took over land that had been uh, growing chemical commercial corn for, uh, for decades, took it over and in 13 years had totally transformed the land. So a relatively small scale farmer, I think about over, a, you know, about 120 acres, so relatively small scale. Um, but he was growing diversified crops. He was really rehabilitating the soil. He had seen the pocket ponds come back and the frogs come back and the birds and the bees and you're standing on the land and it's literally almost noisy with the sound of insects and birds and animals and it was amazing and I asked him how he was able to financially do it right he's not a big scale it's not at large scale and how does he find a market for his products and what he said is he was able to make the agroecology work because of the economic structure he was able to tap into which is a farmer co-op called Organic Valley that you might be most familiar with its dairy products its milk and other products it also has a produce co-op so he as a relatively small scale farmer was able to sell his products into this co-op that was able to um, pull together products from a number of small farmers and then therefore have kind of a large enough supply of you know zucchini or green peppers or whatever the product was to sell to a larger marketplace so even though he was small scale, he was able to tap into that infrastructure. Uh, I also think that there's real value. You mentioned in the question kind of that direct market selling. So when, when you say that, I think of farmers markets, which have grown to um, grown, you know, to thousands and thousands across the country from just a couple hundred in the mid 1970s. I think about community supported agriculture, which directly connects consumers to farmers. I think that's a really valuable, new and thriving part of the food chain. You know, is it the solution to everything? No, but does it claim to be or have to be? No, um, but it is an incredibly powerful way to directly support farmers and have those small scale farmers be able to stay on the land. If you look at the kind of pie chart of where a typical food dollar goes in the United States, uh, less than 10% of that goes back typically to the farmer. When you have those direct consumer to farmer relationships, you're making sure that so much more, um, you know, in many cases, 100% of your dollar goes to that farmer directly. So I also think that's an important part. Again, I don't think it's like we're all going to be buying directly from farmers, but I don't think anybody's arguing that that needs to be the case. I think what I'm arguing for is uh, a diversity of farm size, a diversity of farm farmers, a diversity of um, economic arrangements that reflects a kind of healthy food system. And I've been really, uh, really excited to see how much that direct consumer to, to farmer marketplace has grown over the past decade or so. 
Great. And the next question comes from Morgan. Uh, she asks, or, or request of you, can you talk about demand for organic products? From what I have, what I have seen, the demand has really increased um, from organic farmers, but they can't always meet the demand. How has this issue become solved? Um, food, hub, food hubs? Question mark. Yeah. Right. No, this is such a great question because demand for organic is off the charts and you are absolutely right the supply is not meeting the demand so you would talk to you know any of my former economics professors in graduate school and they would say well anna it's just a simple demand supply curve if the demand is growing then supply will just follow and we don't need to worry about it because the market will the market will solve it um well we all know that that's not how the real world works that certainly doesn't work that way in the food system and that's because there's a whole set of policies and regulations that um and factors that make it really hard for farmers to transition to organic uh, because there is a whole bunch of financial risk to do so. It, uh, secondly, there is uh, all of the um, supports that, that other countries offer farmers to transition to organic that don't exist in this country. So in some European countries, farmers are actually incentivized, given subsidies if they transition, um, helped with training programs if they transition. None of that, uh, or very little of that exists here, although we're starting to see a little bit of policy and a little bit of funding in that direction. Um, so we, I think if we're talking about how do we make sure that um, supply is matching this growing consumer demand, we have to get active in the realm of policy. Um, one of the great new organizations out there I recommend all of you to get involved with is a group called Food Policy Action, and that helps you look at how your elected officials vote on these critical issues. Um, and we also uh, have to talk about things like um, land access and you know how do we ensure that more farmers are able to get land access and we have to even look at things like um, how do we make sure that our financial institutions even understand kind of language of organic agriculture I was talking to one farmer who is telling me that he and his small town was struggling to get the bank to give him a ten thousand dollar loan so he could build a hoop house to extend his growing season on his organic farm but he knew that his neighbor you know down the road was able to get a half a million dollar loan to build a huge confinement operation for poultry to be a contract operator for Tyson. So it's 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 super complex. You know, it's not about one thing. Um, but I think that that what's important to um, make sure people understand is that. Um, the reason why there aren't more organic farmers and aren't isn't more organic farmland in this country is not because people don't want it, but because there's all these barriers to growing that land. Because I certainly hear people who uh, try to argue back at me, well, Anna, you know, if everybody really wanted organic, then how come such you know such a few percentage of, of farmland in this country is is organic certified? And you know, here's the answer. Again, the answer is all of these complex policy banking, land issues, you know, all of that stuff combined, that's really tamping down the growth of organic farming when it should be, uh, the supply should be growing to match that demand. Um, I, I want to say, I know we're coming up uh, close to the end here, and for more resources on this, I know Food Tank covers these issues so well. Um, so obviously, uh, uh, you know, Food Tank has great resources. You can also watch a short video that we produced at foodmyths.org that talks about a lot of these issues. Foodmyths.org is um, one of the, the, the websites that we've created at Real Food Media. And then if you have any further questions, feel free to go to Real Food Media and shoot us questions. We would be happy to pull together resources, help connect you with other organizations that can answer some of your questions. Because obviously, in this short webinar, we're not able to, to, to cover everything. That's great, Anna. And I, I, you answered one of our other questions in that as well, which was the transitional farming being being able to find the resources for conventional farmers to transition into organic. So I think we have time for just one more short question. Uh, and so this question reads, can you talk about consumers when they are at the supermarket? How can we decipher what type of food we are buying? How do we know if something is GMO? And then maybe just ending on what exciting developments you might see that make organic more accessible. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so I mean, one of the best ways I like to say, two things, um, it's a great question to end on. Two things I like to say, number one is probably the most important decision you make about your food is choosing where to shop. 
Uh, so, you know, if you are, if you can near a farmer's market, you know, if that's your, if you're going to a farmer's market, you're very guaranteed about what, what products um, you're going to encounter. Or, uh, you know, is there a locally owned uh, grocery store that really has a high bar for the products that it carries in its store and you can support them with your food dollars? Go for that. I, I'm very lucky near my house, there's a store that has a really great set of buying practices and it's, it's you know, cereal aisle is almost entirely free of any, you know, Fruit Loops and um, Count Chocula cereals and so I can take my kids shopping, my two kids shopping with me and they're not whining about all the junk food on the shelf. So number one is kind of the where you shop is, is kind of helps make a lot of those hard decisions for you. Um, the second thing I would say is that, you know, even though we don't have GMO labeling in this country, there are a lot of ways still to know if you're eating something that has GMOs in it. Um, there is a new effort called GMO Project, uh, non, sorry, non-GMO Project, um, a non-GMO Project Certified. And that, uh, I don't remember their latest count, I think they have something like 32,000 products that they've certified, some huge number. Um, so that's kind of, that organization has kind of stepped in where the regulation is lacking in this country around labeling. So you can look for their their um, certification. It's a, 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 a monarch kind of uh, iconic monarchy butterfly. Uh, the other thing to know is that if you remember back to one of my earlier slides, to date we've only commercialized a, a handful of crops in this country. And so if their corn, their cotton, canola, soy, uh, uh, papaya, um, there was a recent introduction of a GMO uh, uh, apple, but so we, there aren't a lot of foods in the marketplace, there's a few other produce items that are GMO, but they're really not in the marketplace yet. So if you're eating whole foods, which is you know good for your body and good for your health and good for the planet, if you're eating um, whole foods uh, and you're not eating processed foods, you're eliminating a lot of potential GMOs um, uh, you know, in your diet. So that's another approach you can take, again, short of having that GMO labeling, uh, uh, having that GMO label. Um, so there are those things that we can do um, as individual consumers, but you know, as I always say, these issues are so complex, we are not going to shop our way out of them. Uh, we are going to organize our way to the solutions that we want to see. We're going to you know, speak up uh, as consumers for the kind of labeling we want to see. So if you're not already involved in kind of signing on and being a part of the call for GMO labeling, that's one thing we all can do as consumers. And to let our favorite brands know how we feel. I mean, I definitely was on the phone with Kashi saying, how can you, as this brand that purports to be all about health and nature, not label that you have GMOs and not get GMOs out of your supply? Um, so those are some of the things that we can do. And if you have other ideas, I would love to hear them at Real Food Media. Media. Just being involved with an organization like Food Tank is another thing you all are doing and can do. And, uh, you know, again, I am really encouraged by how much more awareness there is today about these issues than there was even five years ago. And I certainly know in reading the industry financial analyst coverage of uh, what's happening in supermarkets and what's happening in the food sector, the industry is waking up that more and more Americans want real food, they want fresh food, they want uh, fruits and vegetables, they want healthy food, and they don't want GMOs. And I'm uh, excited to see what happens over the next couple of years in the marketplace and look forward to working with, with all of you and connecting in various ways. Thank you, Anna. And unfortunately, we're out of time today, but thank you to all of our listeners as well for sending in their questions. And Anna, once again, it was truly a pleasure to have you here. I just want to remind our audience that this webinar was recorded, and so you can review it again. It'll be posted on foodtank.com later today. Uh, and thank you again to everyone for participating, and I hope you have a great rest of your day.